good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Daniel from ISWA, and I'm hosting today's webinar looking at the challenges and opportunities of waste management during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today from around the world. We had almost a thousand registrations from almost 100 different countries. So we've got a truly global audience tuning into this webinar today. We'll be joined by six international experts from around the ISWA community who will answer a few questions, followed by a short Q&A. All participants are muted at the moment, but we encourage you to type your questions into the question tab to the right of your screen. We'll answer as many as we can, and what we don't answer, we'll answer after the webinar um, and post it on the ISWA COVID-19 Information Hub. We're living in unstable and uncertain times. The current health, economic and social instabilities are posing significant challenges to the waste industry. It's putting authorities and waste workers under significant pressure. At ISWA, it's our duty to ensure that our members and the wider waste management industry have the knowledge, information to keep our towns and cities clean and healthy. Proper waste management is an essential public service that cannot be overlooked in this time of crisis. That's why at ISWA, we've created a COVID-19 knowledge hub and we've initiated this series of webinars. This opening webinar is to set the scene to consider the main global challenges and opportunities. And we'll go into more in-depth discussions later in the series, beginning with worker health and safety on the 13th of May. Before I introduce you to our speakers, I want to give you a little introduction to ISWA, since many of you joining today are not yet members, yet. Um, but first of all, I want to recognize our sponsors, Veolia, City of Rotterdam, Ecomondo and Messi München. Um, we cannot do this without our sponsors and, of course, also our Platinum members, of which there are too many to mention out loud, but um, without the support and generosity of all of these members, we cannot do any of this. And this webinar comes to you for free. Of course, we cannot work for free and we count on the support of our members. Um, I know there are many hundreds of you registered for this who are not yet members, and I encourage you to check the link here, um, sign up or contact us directly. Our membership offer is flexible, with discounts for students, low-income countries, and online members. We'll also be doing some member-only webinars so soon, so do join us for them. Um, ISWA. ISWA is a global, independent, non-profit association working in the public interest to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste management worldwide. We represent all stakeholders within the waste management industry and beyond. We consist of private companies, municipalities, universities, academics, young professionals and more. With representation in over 100 countries, we're truly global. And some of those members are here today with us as speakers. So I'm going to introduce you to our speakers one at a time. Um, I will say your name, then please quickly introduce yourself, um, your role within ISWA, your day job and your location. Antonis. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Antonis Mavropoulos. I'm ISVAS president. I'm connecting from Greece, which is my origin and my country. And I would be very happy to contribute to this uh, very interesting seminar. I have to say that I really, I'm really enjoying that ISVAS has taken very important and immediate response uh, reaction to the COVID-19 crisis. And I hope this will set up a benchmark for the next years too. Thank you, Antonis. Carlos. Hi, everybody. It's an honor and uh, I'm really happy to join this first CISO webinar. I'm Carlos Silva Filho. I'm ISO Vice President and I'm based in Brazil, uh, where I'm the president of the Brazilian Association of Waste Management Companies, ISVA national member, and uh, I'm happy to share uh, some thoughts and contribute with uh, uh, the construction of best practice under this pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Anne Woolridge. Hi, I'm Anne Woolridge. I'm the chair of the Healthcare Waste Working Group for ISWA. And as you can imagine, we've been very, very busy. Um, quite happy to engage in this um, webinar. It's quite interesting because my day job is healthcare waste. I'm the chief operating officer of a company called Independent Safety Services Limited and also offering advice and support for the writing of guidance across the sector really. So UK government, the devolved nations and also helping with and WASH and the World Health Organization in terms of guidance with respect to healthcare waste. Thank you. Thank you Anne. And Scheinberg. Hello, my name is Anne Scheinberg. I am uh, uh, since about a year, the chairman of the ISWA Working Group on Recycling and Waste Minimization. 
I am uh, a recycling specialist, uh, worked the first half of my career on uh, high income countries and the second half on low and middle income countries. And I'm particularly here, I think, to talk about uh, why we shouldn't abandon recycling in the corona crisis and also about the people who are doing the recycling and the consequences for them and how to help those people stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And I would like to invite Nicolas to introduce himself. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Nicolas Humez and I'm the chair of the Hazardous West Working Group. Uh, in, in my daily life, I'm, um, I'm working for um, uh, Sap Industry, which is a subsidy of uh, Veolia for the hazardous waste management in Europe. And I'm in charge of public affairs in this uh, company. And uh, as you may know, at the moment, we are really, really busy with this um, big crisis. And uh, we are on, on day to day uh, trying to find solution to all problems we, we face. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, so, uh, we do have one more speaker, but he's unable to connect at the moment, Atilios, but we will introduce him as soon as he can join us. Um, my first question is on global trends, and it goes to Antonis. Antonis, um, what are the dynamics for MSW during this period? Um, do you spot any remarkable trends, and are these trends uniform across the globe? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think we can speak about uh, two different types of global trends. One is about the semantics of waste, and it, the second one is more technical, it's about waste generation. Let me start with the semantics. I think one of the most important trends this period is the fact that worldwide governments, local authorities, and regions recognize how essential it is to have waste management services uninterrupted during the pandemics. I'm saying this because in many cases we discussed, especially in Western Europe and rich countries, we discussed about waste management and we focus on circular economies, resource recovery. Right now is a period we realize how important is a proper waste management service for the quality of our urban lives. And this is, I think, something that we need to build on that. We need to remind everyone that the primary scope of waste management is to protect human health and environment. This is very important to be reminded because sometimes when we discuss a lot about different aspects of resource recovery, we forgot how fragile are our societies still. How and this pandemic comes here to remind everyone that health protection is a high priority and it's also the highest priority in waste management. There is a second important trend, which is global one also, for which we have to build on that. And this is about a new relationship between science and this policy. The pandemics proved to all the public audience worldwide that in crucial issues, scientific support of political decisions and data-driven uh, decision-making is absolutely necessary for proper response. And this is something for which we suffer in waste management because for the last 10, 15 years in waste management, we suffer from what is called the death of expertise. Everyone who has read an article in a newspaper comes and has an opinion in depth about subjects that are for which they are literally uh, incapable to speak. So bringing back the, the importance of expertise and science in decision making is also a very positive thing for us. Now going to more technical issues, I think if you allow me to say, also it's very early to make complete conclusions. What we live mainly in Western world this period is the revenge of single-use plastics. After three years of efforts to ban single-use plastics, to reduce them, to put them under a specific framework, then single-use plastics are striking back today. And this time with the gloves, with the masks, with the personal protective equipment that might be infectious, we literally cannot recycle them, although we would like to, unless we do special things before that, for which I'm in chamber we'll talk later. But when I'm saying it's the revenge of single-use plastics, I'm speaking both in quantities, as in 
USA, we have 300% increase of the single-use plastic bottles of disinfectants in many states. Several states in USA, again, they are trying to ban reusable bags with the, uh, with the argument that has no evidence that reusable bags are transmitting the virus. And even in Europe, we know very well, and today is written in many newspapers, that the plastic industry is trying to use the pandemics as an excuse to delay any new regulation on single-use plastics, either in European or national level. For me, the things are very simple. There is no reason to make not even one step back from the policies on single-use plastics and recycling. We can maybe uh, afford that not all countries can perform the same way. We can maybe afford that waste management operations are also suffering from lack of personnel and resources during the period. But this is not a reason to change our policies and focus on circular economy, plastics and single-use plastics. And I want to finish with the last trend that I think is becoming very important. And I face it in my country, but I know it's a problem, at least in all the global south. Well, you know, waste management workers, by definition, formal and informal, are in daily contact with waste. So they are more vulnerable than other categories of population in potential health problems. In this way, one of the key issues that is rising all around the world is the need to protect waste workers, formal from informal, as a special asset that provides an essential service. And for this, ISVA, and not only, the International Labour Organization, many unions, and a lot of other NGOs are advocating to put the protection of waste workers in the center of our attention this period. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, thank you very much, Antonis, for your very interesting answer. Um, we will go a little bit deeper into the topic of the informal waste workers, which you mentioned in the following question, but I first want to ask Carlos um, about the trends in lower income countries. Uh, situations uh, are diverse and dependent, depending on local and national constraints. Are there any best practices or recommendations that you have for low middle income countries? Yes, uh, Daniel, and uh, uh, I'll take on uh, some of the Anthony's uh, remarks. Uh, what we are seeing uh, here in, in South America, and uh, I, I can follow, it's the same uh, a situation in um, many uh, developing countries, is uh, first an increased concern on uh, best practices for waste management. I see it's growing, uh, uh, this, this concern, despite it uh, should have always been in place, because uh, waste management is uh, 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 crucial. It's uh, an essential service, not only during a pandemic, but uh, uh, every day. Uh, uh, waste management uh, service is, uh, uh, as we are saying uh, on ISVA's recommendations, is a, a, a sanitary barrier together with the health system to prevent several diseases. Uh, uh, several contaminations. So this is a trend I, I, I can see in many countries that now uh, 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 people are taking like a, a, a better look and a special attention uh, uh, regarding waste management services. And uh, uh, also uh, we are trying to keep full services uh, uh, during this uh, uh, isolation times, during these uh, uh, quarantine times. So we, we have really uh, uh, a, a role, an important role uh, to achieve. But on the other hand, despite all this concern, despite countries had uh, 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 classified waste management services as essentials, we uh, uh, can feel a shortage on several basic items to our workers, uh, uh, such as masks, such as uh, sanitizers. So uh, it's a kind of a, 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 a difficulty uh, uh, because we have this uh, uh, role to keep uh, 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 doing the services, to keep providing the services, but on the other hand, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some kind of uh, a shortage on, on items. And uh, uh, it's important to say that as far as I'm uh, 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 getting news from all over the world, uh, the waste industry has delivered a quick contingency plan. Uh, the waste uh, industry has delivered a quick response to every demand that has raised. 
So uh, uh, the perception uh, is increasing that we are ready to provide our services. And uh, uh, we must really be not only uh, uh, on paper, but we really uh, need to be uh, uh, recognized and uh, uh, considered as essential service in, in practice. Okay, thank you, Carlos. I think Anne Scheinberg has something to add to that. I Thank you. I, I wanted to put a little bit of history into this and say, actually, it was the cholera epidemics that started the waste management industry in, the, in, in London. And so we are in some way coming full circle. And one of the things that I feel it's really important to mention, not only about waste workers, is that fighting any or controlling any pandemic depends as much as on social solidarity as it does on technical proficiency. Also, uh, if uh, in the starting of cholera epidemics, they had to make sewers for everybody, even people in the slums, uh, paid for by the rich, because otherwise the rich couldn't protect themselves from the disease. And so I think also, when we think about waste management workers, sometimes they're considered the lowest of the low or informal recyclers. We have to understand that both their work and their welfare is important to everybody's health. The next topic, um, and the question is for you, um, uh, for countries outside of the EU and North America, so uh, outside of the high income countries, most recycling is done by independent or informal recyclers who collect materials simply to feed their families. What does COVID-19 mean for them and what precautions can and should they take? Thank you. In many countries with a lot of informal recyclers, such as South Africa, but also some countries in Europe like Serbia, there are many people who can't eat because they are uh, in lockdown. They would normally be picking up recyclables and now they are not allowed to go out. And also even people who are in formalized recycling situations, so as those in Colombia or Brazil, um, often the governments are telling people stop recycling uh, because of COVID. At the same time, I see even here in the Netherlands, a tremendous amount of new things being littered. And so the environment is changing quickly and nobody is really thinking about uh, what these informal workers actually need. I get my information from the website of, the, of WeGo. I'm just going to show it here briefly and it'll appear in the uh, uh, it, it's on, the, on it's on the screen at the moment. Yes, they have um, a series of posters about decreasing the risks for informal uh, collectors. This particularly one, particular one is telling what workers should do. There's also one that is for me as a recycling expert the only clear information about the relationship of virus uh, residues on materials. So on aluminum, uh, the virus stays for two to eight hours. For steel, it stays 48 hours or two days. For all other materials, uh, plastic is five days, glass is four days, paper is four to five days, wood is four days, and surgical gloves, it stays eight hours. So I, I, cop, I follow also the advice of my ISWA colleague, Anne Woolrich, who says, for waste workers, washing your hands with soap and water, or for waste employees, providing hand washing with soap and water is one of the best protections. Also reiterating that people who are working with waste shouldn't be touching their faces. Um, but all of this requires that we, as the waste management and recycling industry, that we help the people who are doing the work and support them in working as safely as possible. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the advice from Anne Woolridge, and I would like to ask you, Anne, um, what is the greatest challenge in dealing with healthcare waste generated by patients of COVID-19, and what is the best option for disposal of potentially infected waste? I think it comes down to a range of things, and initially it comes down to segregation. We have a range of wastes being generated at the moment. And while we may be seeing the volumes of PPE and other medical wastes increasing, we have to look at the relative risk of those wastes. So where we have a COVID patient or a patient with COVID-19, they will be, and particularly where there are a lot of medical type waste, there'll be some pharmaceutical waste, there will be ventilator type waste, there'll be um, collection mechanisms for urine and feces and proper genuine medical waste. We need to ensure that those wastes are captured and treated appropriately, not necessarily incineration, but where alternative treatments are in place, we should be genuinely treating those as infectious medical wastes. There are a vast amount of other wastes at the moment, including, as Anne Scheinberg has referred to, what we're now starting to refer to as social distancing wastes. So wastes where we have people that are wearing PPE, but they're not contaminated with splatter or body, genuine body fluids. They may have been in contact with people that have got COVID-19. There may be, as, as Anne's referred to again, some small volumes of particles. This is quite different to our full biomedical waste that need to go for treatment. So where we, we can start to use time here, so it's a bit like when we deal with other radioactive waste or anything like that, we use time, distance and shielding. So we keep ourselves away from the waste in the first place, particularly the social distancing waste. If we can store a lot of that waste for 72 hours, which has been recommended through the World Health Organization, through um, other agencies as well, and I'm working with the UK government on these timelines, so 72 hours, then we can start to treat those wastes as a non-hazardous waste. And we've had a couple of questions as well about will the profile of waste start to change? Will we have a lot more medical waste in our general wastes? I think if we start to call them social distancing wastes rather than a medical waste, even though they look like medical wastes, we may be able to start to make some distinctions here. One thing I do want to raise very specifically is that a lot of the patients that have COVID that are highly unwell have other conditions as well other medical conditions. So in, a, in addition to dealing with the infection of COVID, we also need to consider that those wastes may also have the hepatitis that we deal with, the HIV, TB, all those other viruses that we would normally manage as healthcare waste. We have to be cognizant of the fact that while this is an awful pandemic, there are still other people that are sick with other diseases. And we have to ensure that just because it's a COVID type waste, we have to ensure that these other conditions are managed as well. So where waste is required to be incinerated because of its other contaminants, that should stay. We should be treating anything that is known to be infectious or reliably suspected. And this is where our PPE from, um, that are just being generally worn, don't necessarily class as a medical waste. So while we are seeing pressure by an increase in volume and a decrease in weight into the system, we have to still make sure that we, our healthcare services continue to service those healthcare facilities. We have to be very careful that we don't suddenly turn everything into a healthcare waste because it looks like PPE, it looks like a mask, it is gloves, it is outerwear that people are using for their own protection. We also need to be aware that what I'm seeing at a personal level in the middle of the UK is I'm seeing a lot of linen being thrown away into the clinical waste because there's been a patient that's got COVID. It's quite, it's, they call it a labile virus. In effect, COVID is like a little ball of genetic material with a fatty outside with little protein sticking out of it. It isn't massively resistant to things. It will dry out and it will, um, as we've seen, it breaks down over time. So we need to ensure that we can use heat where necessary, but not necessarily high temperature incineration. Washing. If we have facilities for washing clothes, for washing linen, we should be keeping those wastes out of the waste stream. 
we need to ensure that we do mitigate the threat against waste workers and that may be using social distancing PPE. It will also be giving them welfare facilities to ensure that they can wash their hands because what we don't want is more people getting sick. At the moment, there is no evidence to suggest that waste is a vector for COVID. It is very much through aerosolized droplets, through coughing, sneezing, and even speaking. So we're all in our socially isolated spaces here separately. But we do need to be aware that it is passed on, also through transmission by the, to, from the hands to the face, eyes, nose, and mouth. So if well, while ever we can put in facilities to ensure that people can keep clean, not only their personal hygiene, but environmental hygiene. So it's about keeping buildings clean. It's about ensuring that we keep people well to keep them out of the healthcare sector. Um, as I say, currently there's no research to suggest that waste is a vector, and there's also no research to suggest a lot of the healthcare wastes themselves are a vector. The vector itself is through the air and touching. Does that answer your question, Daniel, or did you want me to lead into any other aspects of this? That was very good, thank you, and I really enjoyed your point about social distancing waste and this distinction. Um, I think this leads us nicely to um, hazardous waste and Nicola. Um, Nicola, um, are you seeing an increase in volumes of waste coming to your hazardous waste facilities, and how are you ensuring that all the facilities are operating effectively in this situation? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, concerning the first question, and first of all, the, the situation can be very different from one country to another. It depends on the existing infrastructures and the capacities for the treatment uh, of the hazardous waste, and also depends on how strict uh, is the, the, the lockdown and, and thus how it impacts industrial activities. It is important to say that uh, the hazardous waste treatment facilities never stop during the crisis. Part of the healthcare waste, uh, as Anne said, are treated in uh, hazardous waste incinerators. And during this period, where the, the quantity and mostly the volume of healthcare waste rise by 20 to 40 percent, all permitted capacities are used. Uh, what we observed uh, is a change in the distribution of the different categories of hazardous waste. Some industrial activities work intensively like for example the pharmaceutical sector and others slow down or even have stopped completely like uh, the automotive industry and all the suppliers. Um, hazardous waste from households and uh, hazardous waste in small quantities, drums or buckets from craftsmen activities, garages or SMEs completely disappeared uh, due to the lockdown. Another important observation is that um, non-dedicated facilities which treat hazardous waste as a side activity, slow down or drastically reduce or even shut down part of the cement industry due to the stop of activity in the construction sector. And we, as dedicated operator to the treatment of hazardous waste, were able to take over. Finally, um, if I take the case of Europe, we face uh, an increase of transboundary shipments with, uh, within the EU from countries where treatment capacities are lacking, I, I should say precisely where facilities dedicated to hazardous waste treatment are lacking, to countries where sufficient dedicated cap capacities exist. But regarding import of hazardous waste from uh, uh, outside the EU, it's a brutal stop. And that worried me, uh, not because of the lack of business, but because it means that potentially stockpiles of hazardous waste will grow and grow in the coming months with uh, all associated risks uh, for health and the environment. So to conclude on, on this first question, I think that increase is not really the right word um, which defines the best uh, the situation. I would rather say a shift. There is a shift in terms of nature of hazardous waste, a shift from non-dedicated to dedicated hazardous waste treatment facilities, and a shift in terms of movement of waste. And, and regarding the, uh, the fact that we, uh, we, we are effectively in operation, I think that um, the, the first challenge at the beginning of the crisis was uh, for all of us to fix the status of our activities as essential, ensuring that all employees who have to be on site to operate the facilities can circulate freely during lockdown, securing supplies and intervention from subcontractors and facilitating the help of authorities in case of problem. 
Um, the second action concerned, uh, in fact, behaviors and work practices. We apply new safety measures in order to protect workers by adapting the management of uh, operation teams and uh, their way of working and deploying teleworking for all others. And last but not least, we provide all necessary personal protective equipment to everybody. And this is probably the most tricky point during this crisis. Indeed, we as a hazardous waste operator use uh, a lot of PPEs for the protection against chemical risks. But because of outbreak, access to PPEs is very, very difficult. FFP3 masks, sim uh, special gloves, full suite. We fear um, a shortage for all these PPEs in the coming weeks. It, it could be dramatic. Neither the virus nor the lockdown had an impact on the well functioning of our facilities, but the lack of PPEs could. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, we have to move on. We're running short of time, but I want to ask a couple of questions on recycling to Anne Scheinberg. Um, Anne, um, we're hearing a we're hearing that cities are shutting down recycling in many cases. Is this a sensible measure? Um, it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's, um, and I think it's based on a sense, uh, on a lack of information about how recycling really works. Particularly, you have to think about the fact that if houses are separating their recyclables or households, they can't contaminate themselves. So there, there's no reason that any city should tell its citizens not to continue recycling. There is a reason for them to say, keep your waste for a little bit longer, just as Anne uh, was saying, uh, take, keep it 72 hours before you put it in the bin or before you put it out for collection. And when you put it out for collection, wash your hands first. Um, but where there is a possibility of problem is what I call the interface. The point at which my recyclables, which only people in my household have touched, are put out for recycling for collection or are put into a bin where somebody else will empty it. And so I think that it does require that cities who find recycling to be important at the city level should think about um, extra storage, extra capacity, but recycling is also very important for precisely the same reason that Ann Woolrich talked about, about separating contaminated healthcare waste from non-contaminated. Recyclables are taking as much as 50%, usually around 25% of the waste out of normal waste collection. And if all of a sudden all of that material is coming back into the waste stream, it's going to overload facilities, it's going to put no, uh, waste collectors into problems, it's going to put more things in hazardous waste facilities. So these are all kind of marginal or on the side effects of not maintaining your system. For me as a recycling specialist, I, I also have to say, if recycling was important in the first place, then it gives absolutely the wrong message to say it's not important in a crisis. Recycling is important because as part of the waste management system, it provides the right place for certain materials. And if the, the local authorities say to their people, oh, we have an epidemiological crisis, recycling isn't important, that message is going to stay afterwards. And it will be very hard to reestablish these uh, systems. In uh, low and middle income countries where most recycling is happening by independent or informal recyclers, whether they are formalized like in Brazil and Colombia or tolerated or semi-formalized like in India, what's really important is figuring out a way for them to continue 
to provide the service that they are providing for um, the city by managing its recyclables and preventing them from starving and preventing their families and children from starving by thinking actively about how they can go safely um, about their work. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I think Anne Woolwich had something to add to that. I w yes, I was just going to add that we, knew, you know, the, there is limited research on the viability of this virus in the recycling stream. However, the vector is not going to, you know, it's going to be going through a process as well. So I think we have to be very careful not to go, there may be virus on it, we can't use it. We have to ensure that we, we do this proportionally. And also, as Anne pointed out earlier, we need to make sure that those workers that are working with recycling aren't touching the recycling and touching. It. There are other pathogens in that waste beyond COVID. So I think we have to, you know, where you've had children handling it with dirty hands. We've got to ensure that we keep this in proportion. Yes, it is an awful pandemic, but in terms of waste, we have to make sure that people are managing the waste safely. I think it's also highlighted deficiencies in the system in the past that we're now having to say, are we really ensuring the health and safety of our workers properly? Are we suddenly giving them extra PPE? Like Nicola said, we would always expect to use that in the hazardous waste sector. Maybe we need to address how we protect our workers in, in generally to prevent them coming sick Thank for you. other reasons and as well. Carlos, as you wanted to add something. Uh, I want to take on uh, Andy Feinberg's point and uh, uh, to highlight that the message uh, uh, must be quite clear uh, uh, to the citizens, to the, the overall community. And uh, uh, what we are uh, also trying to say uh, uh, through the different channels is that uh, uh, separate collection and recycling services are uh, a part of the overall waste management system and uh, are part of these essential services that that must keep running. So uh, uh, it's like uh, it would be worse if the message sent out uh, was like we have this uh, uh, kind of service that can be interrupted, that can be stopped. And after all, when we need uh, 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 people's uh, support, it would be uh, uh, very difficult to get it back. And again, uh, 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 we fully endorse all international uh, 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 researches and communications saying that, as uh, Amy Scheinberg just mentioned, waste is not the vector. Waste management uh, uh, does not uh, uh, cause the transmission of the coronavirus. Uh, 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 the coronavirus is uh, uh, spread from different and uh, 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 particular situations like social contact, like uh, 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 taking hands uh, uh, into our faces, but not through waste. So it's, we need to calm down and we need to spread very clear this message. Otherwise, we would, would have a, a panic instead of a pandemic. Thanks, Carlos. And I will give you a moment to reply in a, in a little moment, but I just want Antonis's comment on that. Yes. Um, I want to say a few things because, you know, sometimes we are getting too close the waste management industry and some maybe we lose the global picture. So let's talk about recycling first of all. Well, the main reason that recycling activities are disrupted wherever they are disrupted, because in many cases they are not. As an example, I read yesterday in the waste management world that in UK, despite the fact that there is 20% less personnel available for waste collection and recycling, the recycling is continuously uh, delivered in more than 90% of the cases. So I want to, to make a step back. Why recycling is disrupted? Mainly in the global south, and especially in the Mediterranean region, which I know very well, it is disrupted for a very simple reason. We have 20 or 25% less workers available. So there must be an adjustment of the services. You cannot continue at the same level. And in, sometimes, recycling is a victim of this lack of resources. So, as far as now, I don't know any municipality that intentionally stopped recycling to avoid COVID. Sometimes they adjust the service because they don't have the same personnel. Second thing, I want to tell you this. Even this small disruption of recycling services due to the lack of personnel is becoming bigger now because with the crude oil prices at the lowest level and a lot of problems already in plastic recycling, 
the conditions are very difficult for recycling operators. So if we stop delivering recycling services, which I agree completely with saying there is no evidence to do that, and there are very simple things to do to avoid it, if we stop delivering, we increase the disruption and make it bigger. Now, there is also something else. The disruption also becomes bigger because at the same time, unfortunately, we don't have commercial waste, which is full of recyclables, because everyone is back home. And this cannot be rebalanced by the increase of packaging deliveries. So the, the real problem is not recycling. The real problem is the huge disruption of the economy that impacts also the waste sector. And what we are trying to do is to make this disruption as low as possible for the benefit of all of us. Okay. Thank you, Antonis. Now we will stop with the questions now because we're already running short of time. But um, and I'm sorry we haven't gone into a huge amount of detail due to the time constraints. And this is the first in our webinar series. We will go to more focused topics later in the series. But I want to give each panelist one minute to give a short concluding statement. I want you to tell us, first of all, what is the greatest challenge for the waste management sector at the moment? But secondly, I want you to also, also tell us how can the waste management sector contribute to the global, global battle against the pandemic and be a positive force right now? Um, Nicola, do you want to conclude? Uh, yes, if you want, I can <laughs> say a few words. Uh, on your first question, I, I think for hazardous waste management sector, the, the greatest challenge is, uh, in fact, as I said, the access to PPEs. Not PPEs against the virus, but PPEs for the daily work of our operators dealing with hazardous chemicals. So this is the first challenge, uh, the, the main challenge. And, and regarding your second question, um, I have to say that I'm very proud because we show how adaptable and dedicated we are and our capability to address all the demands from industries, cities and government in this challenging period. So it's very important for me. And if I may, it's my birthday today, <laughs> and I would like to share with you my, my wish. Um, I, I really hope that the, the post-COVID crisis will, will really be the momentum for a radical change in the society worldwide around the three criteria that are very important for me. Benevolence, resilience, and happy sobriety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and happy birthday. Um, and Woolrich. For me, I think the biggest challenge is segregation. As I've said before, I think it is about perception. I think there are multiple challenges. I'm, I'm, not, I'm allowed more than one. Um, it's healthcare waste. We can do lots of things. Um, I think it's also some, so we've got a lot of waste that is now going to be need to be treated. I think we also have opportunities for other technologies that are non-incineration technologies to start to enter the market and to prove how they can work in different environments. Um, I also think that people should be referring to some really good guidance, not only from their national and region, their regions and national governments, but also there's a lot of very good guidance coming out of the World Health Organization and also for the low and middle income countries, Waste Aid have also put guidance out. So there is a plethora of guidance suitable for your economy, suitable for your environment. It's just a matter of finding it with respect to healthcare waste because there's an awful lot that has been written and it's just making sure that you access it suitable for your situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've uh, just, just to add to that, we've got a COVID-19 knowledge hub on this website where we are um, compiling all of these local and regional guidelines, which you can find. I will send you, there'll be a link later on in the PowerPoint. Um, Carlos, would you like to conclude? Yes, Daniel. Thank you. First of all, uh, uh, before I conclude, I I have to thank all our uh, uh, listeners, our members and followers. I have uh, written here some hellos we received through the, the, the chat. So uh, thank you, the people who are following us from Serbia, Hungary, Brazil, France, <laughs> Oman, Argentina, Croatia, Portugal, India and Ghana. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I couldn't follow everyone, then for us, it's very important that to, we have you with us. We have your thoughts and comments uh, 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 shared with us so we can build all this knowledge during this uh, new situation to every one of us. And uh, uh, to conclude, I would say uh, we need to act uh, in three uh, pillars. 
First one is to ensure that essential services are carried without any interruption. Second one, to ensure workers' uh, safety above any measure, because we need this team, we need these people, we need these heroes on the streets. And third, we need to ensure frequent and easy communication to the citizens, to uh, stop fake news, to avoid uh, a dissemination of uh, misunderstandings. And uh, uh, a final message I would say, let's try on a personal basis to express some gratitude, some kindness, some solidarity towards the workers who are uh, on the street uh, carrying our, our waste, uh, carrying uh, those materials we discharge and taking care of our health, of our environment. So thank you and look forward to meeting you uh, in person in the future. Thank you, Carlos. Um, and Steinberg, your conclusion. Yes, thank you. A, a lot of what I was thinking of saying has already been said. I want to say that one of the things that seems to me very important is the idea of solidarity instead of scapegoating. Uh, people working in the waste industry uh, attract a lot of sort of ideas that they are wasted people or they're dirty people. We are the ones that make the waste. We have to give them a lot of credit and a lot of support for handling our waste. The second thing is my conclusion, one of my conclusions is clear heads are very important. We, we need as a waste management global community not to allow ourselves to sink into muddy thinking about waste as a vector, about recyclables as dirty. We, we just have to, we are the ones who think about this on a daily basis. Let's think clearly and let's speak clearly. And the third thing is that people talk about the three R's, the nine R's. I think in this time, the most respective RE word, the most important RE word is respect. Let's respect people who are working with recyclables, who are working with waste. Let's respect the environment and let's respect each other and speak that respect out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for that positive statement. And finally, Antonis. Okay, thanks. Um, I will try briefly to address also some of the questions in my closure uh, comments. Listen, in the times of crisis like this, all of us, that's a human reaction, we reprioritize our priorities, what is important and what is not important. And this is why we face also changes in human behavior. As an example, some of the people that used to recycle, in this period they don't recycle, and they put everything in the mixed waste, I don't know what kind of relief it provides to them, but I know it from my neighborhood and from other neighborhoods, and I saw it also in some comments. This has nothing to do with the importance of recycling. It's the relative priorities they put for themselves that change their behavior. Some other people, as Derek mentioned already, they create problems with littering, throwing around gloves and masks, and putting the risk to the uh, waste collectors and the cleaning personnel. On this. So why I'm saying this, I think that overall we have to think this way. This pandemics oblige everyone and the waste sector to rethink the real priorities. There are three words I want to use. First, importance. The pandemics, this shows how important is the waste management services to be in their uninterrupted for protecting human health. Second, resilience. I think we have to be very clear. Despite the problems that we face in different countries, overall the waste industry seem to, seems to be, and the recycling sector, seem to be resilient. Despite the huge problems we face, someone can speak about the perfect storm, especially about recycling. And third, adaptability. The sector seems capable to adapt in very difficult conditions. Now, what's coming after this? We all know that after the COVID crisis, a huge economic crisis will come. It's already here. 
So what will be the impact of this huge economic crisis to the waste sector? It's probably the, the subject of another seminar two, two months later. But for now, what is more than sure is that the waste management sector has to stop thinking with the business as usual attitude. It has to reestablish a new way of thinking out of the business as usual and reestimate cost benefits and attitudes towards all its activities. And I think to answer a comment, this is also about circular economy, resource recovery and disposal. All of this had to be reassessed, not to change our mindset, but to allocate better our resources during the very difficult period that's coming. Thanks a lot. And I'm really thankful to the hundreds of our uh, followers. We will try everything possible to respond to more questions next days. And thank you very yes, much. Thank Anthony. you, Antonis. Um, I'm very sorry. We've run a little bit over time, so we've not been able to answer any of your questions. We've got a lot of questions and we will uh, do our best to answer all of them. And we will put the answers on, share the answers with you with the recording and post them also on our knowledge hub on the, um, online. Um, we have, this is the first in our webinar series, so thank you for your patience. Uh, it's, it's already our first go at doing something like this, and we have a few more webinars coming up over the next month. We have one on uh, introducing you to ISPA's reports on carbon and soils, but also one focused on health and safety for waste professionals. with some really great experts involved in this. I would um, just like to conclude by saying thank you very much to our excellent speakers for giving us your time. Um, Thank you for everyone who joined. Also, thank you for one speaker who didn't make it, unfortunately, with some technical issues, Attilio. Um, but yeah, really, it was really informative, really helpful, and we'll hopefully see you at the next webinar. So all there is left to say is thank you and goodbye. Bye. Thank you.